the amplitude is a measure of the loudness of the wave. I don't think amplitude ties in directly to any of the concepts in our flowchart. So we're not going to put it in the flowchart. There's no direct link, I don't think, between amplitude and any of these. Or maybe there is between amplitude and energy. Maybe we'll get to that. Um, but the uh, amplitude, uh, anyway, it's a measure of loudness. Frequency and wavelength are measures of pitch. Both frequency and, uh, and wavelength kind of measure the pitch because they move, both move together, right? Anytime you change wavelength, you have to change the frequency. Uh, a big wavelength means the same as a low frequency, a low pitch. And a big amplitude means a loud wave. Okay, so it's good to know what those things mean. Uh, while we're at it, we should also talk about light waves. Light waves also have frequency and, and amplitude. So how, how do you think it's psychologically perceived if you change the frequency of a light wave? What could change about the light if you change its frequency? If the frequency is increased, um, that decreases the wavelength so that... Psychologically, how does that look different? Um, you can't see it from uh, longer distances because it has a short wavelength. Okay. It turns out that that's not really. It turns out that that's not really the way to interpret these. Um, so remember, if you change the frequency of the sound wave, that changes the pitch, right? Mm -hmm. If you change the frequency of a light wave, it changes its color. Mm -hmm. so that was the answer to my question. Like, frequency and wavelength as, are perceived as color. Okay. The yeah. difference between a red wave and a violet wave is that they have different frequencies and different wavelengths. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, uh, yeah. So I think red light has like 700 nanometers wavelength. Violet light is like 400 nanometers wavelength. Okay, so wavelength and frequency of light is perceived as color. So color and pitch are actually kind of similar to each other. The pitch of a sound and the color of light are kind of similar because they both depend on wavelength and frequency. How about if you change the amplitude of a light wave? What would that change about the light? Remember that if you change the amplitude of a sound wave, that changes its volume. It changes the loudness and softness. But what, what corresponds to how loud or soft a, a, wa a sound wave is? What, what corresponds to that with light? Um, the brightness. Okay, intensity. yeah, that's right. So if you have a large amplitude, would that be bright or dim? Um, bright. Yeah, bright. Okay, good. And obviously if the amplitude was zero, then it would be perfectly dark. You couldn't see it at all. Okay, so the amplitude for light is a measure of how bright the light is. For sound, it's a measure of how loud it is. For sound, frequency and wavelength are related to pitch, but for light, they're related to color. Okay, so let's go back to the spring. Um, let's say that uh, this is the natural length of the spring, but then we pull it out to this distance. We pull it out to this distance, and then we let go of it. And what's going to happen when we let go of it? Well, we know it's going to start moving in and out and in and out, but it's never going to get past this point, right? If there's no friction, it can always come back to this point, but it can never get past this point. So it's just going to come here, go to maximum compression, Come back here to where it started, go back here, come back here to where it started. All right, so um, let's label the amplitude in this picture. What's the amplitude? Which distance is the amplitude? Yeah, because this is the maximum displacement from the natural length. I was just saying that this is the furthest that we're ever going to get from the natural length. Uh, most of the time, it'll be closer than here. For example, after we let it go, after we let it go, uh, a couple se uh, a millisecond after we let go of it, it won't be here anymore. It might be here. It might be moving to the, to the left pretty quickly. Right? So uh, most of the time, the displacement is less than this distance. But this is the maximum displacement. So this is the amplitude. This is the amplitude of the oscillations that the spring is going to be going through. The amplitude of the oscillations that the spring is going to be going through. That doesn't mean that this is always the displacement it's going to be at, but this is the maximum displacement it'll ever reach.
Now, when we let go of the when we let go of the spring, what's its kinetic energy the instant we let go of it? What is it? Yeah. How much kinetic energy does this does this have the instant we let go of it? Well, yeah. What does the yeah? What does the kinetic energy measure? That's energy from what? Okay. So what did we think about the kinetic energy the instant we let go of it? I think you were on the right track. Okay. Um, so what was the formula for kinetic energy? So its initial velocity is zero. So yeah. How do we know the initial velocity is zero? Because we just let go of it. Yeah. We didn't throw it. We just let go of it. So it started from rest. Okay. How about when it gets back to here? What would its velocity be? So remember, it's going to go in, and then it's going to come out, and then it's going to go in, and then it's going to come out. How do you know it'll still be zero when it comes back to here? It's changing direction. It's changing direction. That's right. So that's a key principle we keep coming back to in the class. The instant that something changes direction, its speed is zero. The instant it changes direction, its speed is zero. So uh, again, what was the speed when we're at this maximum displacement? Zero. So what's the kinetic energy? So wh where's all the energy? All the energy must be in the potential energy over here. So that must mean this is the point with the maximum potential energy. Can you see how this must be the point with the maximum potential energy? Maybe a potential energy here of 10 joules. Because then what about this point over here? What does it have kinetic energy here? Because it's moving. That's what this arrow indicates. So this is what it's supposed to look like, remember, a couple milliseconds after we let go of it. A couple milliseconds after we let go of the spring, the mass would be over here. Uh, that would put us here. So now the kinetic energy might be, say, 2 joules at this point. So what would the potential energy be? Um, Remember, we started with 10 joules of energy. Okay, would be and what was the kinetic energy at this point? Zero. So what was the total energy here? So what's the U here? Because, remember, we've been assuming no friction. We're always assuming no friction here, which means energy should be conserved. We're assuming that energy should be conserved. So what would E be at this point? Ten. Yeah, the only thing that's the same is E, the total mechanical energy. The total mechanical energy is the same everywhere because there's no friction. We have conservation of energy. But the K and the U are constantly changing. You can see what's happening is the energy right now, the energy is bleeding out of U and going into K. After all, so you can kind of see here that this really was the maximum potential energy. Because here we put all 10 joules into potential energy. Anytime we have to put any of the energy into kinetic, there's less left over for the potential energy. So this is a very important problem solving technique. The maximum potential energy is at maximum expansion or maximum compression. The maximum potential energy is at maximum expansion or maximum compression, because those are the points where we didn't have to waste any energy on the kinetic energy. Because we just figured out that when you're at maximum expansion or compression, you're not moving, either because we just let go of you or because you're changing direction there. So this must be the point with the maximum potential energy. Eventually, if we, as we're moving, we're going to get back to here. We're going to get back to the natural length. We're going to get back to the natural length over here. Now, when we're at the natural length, what's the potential energy going to be? Zero. Oh, that's right. How, how did you know that? Um, because it's, it's, um, it's at its equilibrium. Yeah. How do we know that mathematically? What, what formula do we have that tells us that u would be zero over here? Now that would be gravitational oh, potential sorry, energy, one half right? Kx squared yeah, x one half kx zero. squared, and what? X would equal zero. Yeah, we know that x is zero because now we're, what's our displacement from the natural length? We have no displacement from the natural length at this point. We're not displaced at all from the natural length. So I should have really started with the idea that here, x is zero. Well, when x is zero, u has to be zero from this equation here. But it's also just common sense. 
We know that energy is stored in a spring when you've compressed it or expanded it. There's no energy stored if it's just in its natural length. So what would the kinetic energy be here? 10. Yeah, 10 joules. And what's the total heat? Right. That's not changing because we're assuming no friction. So now we've gotten to the point where we've used up all the potential energy. It's all gone into the zero. 